Hello and welcome to Tala Talks NICU. I'm Dr. Tala and today we are going to be talking about sepsis. As you all know, we're pretty obsessed with sepsis in the NICU and there is literally a bottomless pit of information that you all need to know about sepsis. But instead of going through all the kind of details that you see in a textbook, all the different bacteria that are listed, we decided to break it down into the most practically relevant information. So we've got 18 points of all very clinically important information that you're going to use at bedside. And because you all complain that these videos are too long, we've broken it down into three different parts of six points each. Let's start with point number one. Why do we care so much about sepsis in the NICU? Well, the reason why we care, and I know that you all know this, is that because infants, especially premature infants, have a very weak immune system. They're basically little immunocompromised patients. Just about every single part of their immune system is weaker, starting with the physical barriers that are interfacing with the outside world. So what are those three physical barriers? It's the skin, obviously, the lungs, which have this constant contact with the outside world, as well as the gut. So those are the three main barriers to bacteria and viruses in the outside world. All of those barriers are thinner and weaker in infants, especially in premature infants. Physically, the thickness of all those barriers is thinner. Also, just the ability to fight off bacteria and other infections is also not as well developed. The blood-brain barrier is also not as well developed where the separation between the blood and the inside of the brain and just overall, all the immunoglobulins and the cells that fight diseases in babies are just not as well developed as they are in older kids and adults. Remember as well that a lot of the maternal immunoglobulins, so especially basically IgG, travel across the placenta mostly in the third trimester. So if babies are born earlier than that, they're even missing out on all that passive immunity from the mummy. And then in this setting of a weak immunity, think of all the other things that we actually have to do to preemie babies to get them to survive. All the lines we have to put in, the endotracheal tubes, the umbilical lines, the PIC lines, even just IVs. All of these are constantly irritating the baby's skin and they're a constant access for infection. So what does this all mean? It means that a baby is much more likely to pick up an infection and if that baby gets an infection, it's much more likely to spread all over the body. So a UTI could go into the blood that could then cause meningitis. A skin infection can go into the blood and cause bacteremia. In adults, we pretty much have to be at death's door, like coughing up a lung and high fevers for days before somebody prescribes us antibiotics. That is the complete opposite of babies because you can't wait for them to have an active infection. By that point, it could be too late. So in the unit, we do, as you all know, a lot of the kind of rule outs where we check blood and we just start antibiotics until we prove that they don't have an infection. This is very different from adults where they have to prove they do have an infection before we give them antibiotics. And another thing that's slightly different from adults is even if you do think that the baby has a skin infection or a UTI, it's always a good idea to send a blood culture before you start antibiotics. Because as we already said, it's very easy for that to travel into the blood because we don't have the same barriers. In adults, if you have a skin infection or a sinusitis, they're not gonna send a blood culture before they start antibiotics. So we have to be super careful in the unit, making sure that the babies aren't at increased risk of infection. So that's why many units don't allow you to wear anything below the elbows. So no rings, no bracelets, no watches. We are very careful with how we scrub. Very often we wear gloves. Remember, wearing gloves is not enough. You have to clean the skin very well beneath the gloves. And we also have a very low threshold for making sure that a baby doesn't have sepsis. So they do anything slightly abnormal and we're more likely to send blood and urine or whatever else on those babies. Number two, what is early onset sepsis? I know you've all heard this term. Early onset sepsis is when you have either a culture positive in the blood or CSF, cerebrospinal fluid positive, within the first 72 hours of life. 
And that culture has to be positive for a pathogenic bacteria, so a bacteria that's known to cause infections. So if you grow out like a lactobacillus, which as you all know is a commensal bacteria or probiotic bacteria, then that would not necessarily be called early onset sepsis. We pretty much assume that all cases of early onset sepsis, or nearly all of them, come from the mother. So most of the time, this is up through the vaginal canal and then infecting the amniotic fluid and probably the placenta as well as the baby. That's why we worry so much when the membranes have already been ruptured, so when there's a prolonged rupture of membranes. Obviously, we worry even more when the mother was diagnosed with chorioamnionitis, which literally means that there was an infection of the placenta. Fetuses can also get an infection from the mother through the placenta, as well as hematogenicity spread, so through mommy's blood. Late onset sepsis is when you have a positive culture and the baby is more than 72 hours old and less than three months old. In literature, you'll also see it considered early onset sepsis as up to a week and then late onset sepsis is after a week. So you'll kind of see both of those, but the 72 hours is probably kind of used more. Number three, what causes early onset sepsis in term babies? So in term babies, the most common cause of early onset sepsis, and you know this, is group B strep or group beta streptococcus or also called streptococcus agalactia. This is a different strep from the one that causes strep throat, strep A or strep pyogenes. It's also a different strep that causes pneumonia, the one that we vaccinate against, which is strep pneumonia. Somewhere between a quarter and a third of all mothers are just naturally colonized with group B strep in their vaginal canal. So remember, what does colonize mean? It means that the bacteria are just hanging out there without actively causing an infection. All pregnant mothers in America are tested for group B strep between 35 to 37 weeks. And if they're found to be positive, then they're generally treated before delivery. And there is so much to talk about all of group B strep. If you'd like me to, then just comment below. If the mothers are positive and are inadequately treated, then there's about a 1% chance of a baby becoming infected with group B strep, which doesn't sound that high, but the mortality from group B strep sepsis is very high, up to about 15% which is why it's so important to catch these mothers that are group B strep positive and to make sure that the babies are not infected. Group B strep is a gram positive coccus, so the bacteria is a circular shape and it likes to hang out with other bacteria in pairs as well as chains. This is different from Staphylococcus, so Staph aureus or Staph epi, that likes to hang out in bunches, like bunches of grapes. And the way that you need to remember this is think of group B strep, like three letters kind of lined up, like as if it's forming a chain, versus staphylococcus. Think of all those letters that are like all jumbled up like a bunch of grapes. I promise you it's useful. What about early onset sepsis in preterm babies? Well, preterm babies are a little bit different from the term babies because the most common cause of early onset sepsis in preterm infants is gram negative rods. And the most common bacteria is E. coli or Escherichia coli, which like we keep saying is a gram negative rod. E. coli is definitely the most common, but other gram negative rods that commonly cause infections are Citrobacter, Citrobacter caseri, um, Haemophilus, Influenza, Klebsiella, Pneumonia, and a host of other subspecies as well. And again, a lot of these bacteria are just hanging out on mothers as well as all of us, both in the genital tract as well as in the colon. And a lot of the time, just like with the GBS and the term babies, it is an ascending infection and that's how it gets the babies infected. So rupture of membranes and it climbs up the vaginal canal and infects the baby that way. Number five, what other bacteria do we have to worry about? Well, the one that we always talk about is Listeria, which is a bacteria that is found in unpasteurized cheeses, also in deli meats. Every now and again, there's a massive outbreak in like those pre-packaged salads that you can buy or in spinach or something. And really, honestly, it's a very rare cause of 
early onset sepsis, but we seem to talk about it a lot. The other interesting thing about Listeria is it is actually a gram-positive rod, and there are like a handful of gram-positive rods, so just remember that. Other bacteria we very commonly see in early onset sepsis are Staphylococcus species. So this is probably altogether kind of number two cause of early onset sepsis. So it could be MSSA, so the Staphylococcus aureus is sensitive to methicillin and oxacillin, or it could be MRSA, so methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Other bacteria like Enterococci are also very common. And it could even be like a fungal species, like a candida, causing an early onset sepsis. Six, so what antibiotics do we start for early onset sepsis? So I am based in the US and obviously the antibiotics that you start are really going to depend on the bacteria that you see most commonly, as well as what that bacteria is sensitive to. So here we generally start ampicillin and gentamicin. And the reason we do that is that the two most common cause of early onset sepsis are group B strep, which is sensitive to penicillin, and ampicillin is a derivative basically of penicillin, and E. coli, or a gram-negative rod, which are generally sensitive to gentamicin, which is an aminoglycoside. Because, like we said, listeria is also a gram-positive rod, ampicillin will also kill listeria. Obviously, this may change depending on the clinical course. If the mother has been hospitalized for weeks, maybe even intubated, maybe with pneumonia before she ended up delivering, then maybe we want to start something else kind of stronger because maybe her gram-negative rods are already resistant to gentamicin. So maybe we would start meropenem or, or cefepine. If the mother had a bad skin infection or we knew that she was MRSA colonized, then maybe we would start vancomycin on the baby. Okay, that was the end of part one. I hope that you learned something. Remember to like this video and to subscribe to this channel if you're interested in neonatal content. But most importantly, now go and watch part two and part three. Thank you so much for being here.